In today's world, individuals and organizations have to operate in a constantly evolving environment. The overwhelming amount of information at our disposal can make it difficult to focus and prioritize, let alone understand the big picture. This makes the ability to tap into a curated global network of experts from academia, government, business and civil society a decisive strategic asset for any organization. And this is why strategic intelligence now offers advanced features that enable its users to deep dive and make sense of issues that are the most relevant to them. For example, let's say you want to understand how the Internet of Things can drive sustainability in different sectors. On our current transformation map, you will find that, by selecting thoughtful rules and standards, the Internet of Things can unlock a wide range of benefits for energy, mobility and food systems. But let's imagine you are interested in additional sectors or in diving deeper on these topics. By creating your custom map, you can explore the dynamics most relevant to you and your organization. For instance, you might want to look into ways the Internet of Things creates sustainability opportunities for digitalization in the electricity sector, smarter infrastructure and energy efficiency in the mobility sector, the expansion of circular models, how it can help curb water waste and enable more efficient food systems. Your custom maps effectively become a dynamic monitoring framework embedded in the wider strategic intelligence ecosystem. Every day, our built-in machine learning and artificial intelligence system scans thousands of the world's most trusted research publications and pieces of analysis on hundreds of topics, allowing for the deeper exploration of your selected issues. This information is summarized in continuously updated briefings specific to each map. Strategic Intelligence Advanced Features can also help identify priority signals emerging within your areas of interest, including key clusters and trending topics. This allows you to get clarity out of complexity, stay abreast of the latest global developments, and drive strategic conversations within your organization. Start now. A warm welcome from uh, the World Economic Forum. My name is Stefan Mergenthaler. It's a real pleasure welcoming you to this session among the very first of this year's Sustainable Development Impact Summit taking place in this, in this virtual format. I'm joined in this conversation by Marie McAuliffe. Uh, she's Head of Research at the International Organization for Migration. Thank you very much for joining us. And thanks to, to all of you for being part of this discussion this morning. It's really gratifying to see that so many of you are, are joining this conversation, which we believe is so fundamental to what we are all here for, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. I think it's clear to all of us um, that we need much more joined up thinking. We need to step out of our sectoral and disciplinary silos. We need to build more diverse and encompassing partnerships if we want to really change course and put ourselves on track for the kinds of transformations we need to see in the world. And that is precisely why uh, we uh, convene this Sustainable Development Impact Summit, but it's also why we invested early on as World Economic Forum in this effort we call strategic intelligence to give people an asset to facilitate this kind of joined up thinking about complex global issues and consolidate all the uh, most relevant research and analysis behind that. Let me just remind you that uh, we really want to bring you all into the conversation as well. So you can ask questions and participate uh, by logging into slido.com. You saw the, um, the reference at the beginning of the session. Um, if you haven't taken note of it, it's slido.com and you use the tag SDIS and uh, also make sure that you select the right session. Then you come right in here and we bring in your, your conversation. What we want to do here, and, and, and Marie, you've been uh, working with us for several years now on this with a focus on migration, which uh, we feel is a very good illustration of one of those complex global issues which really cut across 
so many other areas in ways that are often overlooked. And maybe just to kick us off, Marie, if you could give us a sense of uh, how you, from the perspective of the UN at this moment in 2020, are looking at this global landscape of, of migration. What is, what is really top of mind for you um, when, when you look at these, these key issues on migration? Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, Stefan, and, and to also to your team for this invitation to, um, to really go through uh, some of the enormous benefits in, in relation to the transformation maps and the strategic intelligence. As you have mentioned, uh, I started working uh, with the forum in 2016 on this particular transformation map. And part of the attraction for me when uh, the kind of the call came out for people who were interested in working on this was exactly as you have articulated and that wonderful video at the beginning articulated the ability to um, bring together some of the really big sort of global trends that have been occurring for quite some time to be able to carve out some clarity for people who need to get across uh, complex issues in a very short space of time. So the two elements that I particularly were drawn to was the briefing and the written sort of content, but also the how it's um, interactive and you are able to see the linkages. So at the moment, one of the things that we know is incredibly pressing uh, and in the context of, of course, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, the summit is inequality and uneven development. Uh, migration is in many ways central to this, as many people know, uh, migration is recognised in a number of different um, targets in the Sustainable Development Goals, in the SDGs, and we've also been highlighted uh, the, the growing inequality through the Human Development Report put out by the United Nations and UNDP in particular, and last year's really did highlight that inequality is uh, growing both within countries, but also uh, increasingly and certainly as it relates to international migration between countries. So we know that inequality and uneven development is one of the drivers of international uh, migration. Uh, secondly, in the current environment, it's also really important to highlight conflict and security challenges. Uh, we've defined this broadly. Of course, we're talking about uh, civil and transnational conflict or war, in other words, but we're defining that in a very broad sense. So it can encapsulate uh, some of the aspects related, for example, to uh, slow onset uh, climate change impacts, such as food insecurity and so forth. And as you'll see uh, on the outer ring, uh, one of the, the wonderful aspects to do with the transformation map is you can click straight through, you can see climate change, click straight through to climate change and get the big picture on climate change as you need to. And then you can just hit back and return back to the migration uh, map as well. So it's a very easy way of being able to navigate those connections. And lastly, I really do want to point out in the context of COVID-19 and a lot of challenges that we are seeing right the way through the migration cycle, migrants rights, uh, human rights for migrants as, um, as others may call it, is central uh, to migration and we are seeing very significant challenges uh, right the way through the migration cycle in regards to the immobility uh, restrictions in relation to COVID-19. And here I'm talking about the inability for people who are facing you know, conflict and insecurity in their home countries to be able to leave them. Uh, we're not seeing the um, ability for people who are seeking international protection, for example, asylum seekers being able to enter other countries. And we're seeing many, many migrants stranded, as well as a lot of migrant workers uh, right on the front line in different sectors uh, around the world. So those are some of the pressing issues that go straight to the heart, I think, of uh, development and how we need to be working in partnership to be able to, you know, it's an overused term, but it's still a highly relevant one to build back better after COVID-19. Thanks, mm -hmm. Jeff. Excellent. Thank you. And maybe then moving uh, more specifically to the link with the uh, 2030 um, Sustainable Development Goal agenda, 
where where would you see and i think we, we we mentioned in the introduction migration really cutting across a whole whole range of issues but when, when you look at that link to the 2030 agenda where would you see sort of the most um, uh, pressing issue to address in in that context and 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 why why does it matter and why is it maybe um sometimes also overlooked in 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 that sense well, i think it's uh there are a lot of challenges, of course, being felt right the way through in terms of COVID-19. Um, in pointing to the SDGs, the, the first one, of course, is target 10.7, which is safe, orderly, regular migration. And global governance is, is key to this. And the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, Regular Migration, as we know, is finalised uh, by states in la late 2018. So uh, COVID-19 has posed a, a number of challenges. Uh, as I mentioned, in regards to human rights, of course, but also there's some real opportunities, uh, I think, too. And we know, of course, that uh, cheaper remittances, for example, is again highlighted in the SDGs. We have seen the longer term projections, of course, because of the economic impacts that uh, the globe is facing in regards to COVID-19. But we're also seeing some very interesting data coming through um, with a 20% decline predicted in international remittances in 2020, but quite significant surges in some origin countries. So we're seeing inflows increase. Uh, Mexico, the Mexican Central Bank, for example, has reported a, a very significant increase, as has Nepal, as has the Philippines, and so on and so forth. It's not consolidated yet. Um, of course, there will be reporting uh, in, in coming months at the global level. But what it does highlight, and we've seen this from previous uh, pandemics, of course, they were on a much more local scale. They weren't global as COVID-19 is. But during MERS and SARS, for example, we have seen increases in international remittances to countries that have been affected because migrants, of course, want to help their families and communities. So if they are able to, they will be sending back remittances. So what that means in the context of development and also softening and alleviating some of the uh, COVID-19 impacts, that migrants are not only frontline essential workers physically, but in terms of international remittances, they will be on the front line for socioeconomic recovery. So if we can assist uh, the flows of remittances, and what I mean by this is going back to the SDGs, to, to make uh, remittances cheaper, uh, faster, safer, uh, more reliable, uh, traceable, and so forth. And, and part of the way uh, of achieving this, of course, is through mobile money applications uh, in different parts of the world. We've seen sub-Saharan Africa have a very high penetration rate, for example, because their formal banking system isn't um, necessarily as robust as other parts of the world. So part of seeing some of the data coming through, being able to analyse that, look at it in the big picture does lead you to identify some clear actionable kind of outcomes and priorities uh, both in terms of uh, international migration more broadly being you know an opportunity not just a challenge and of course we have to recognize that it can be a challenge but also in terms of the use of technology to be able to um, soften and alleviate some of alleviate some of those impacts Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you for making that link. And maybe um, just to illustrate for um, our participants here, just the the magnitude of what you were, were describing, I just wanted to bring in um, a little focus on, on, on data and helping us visualize the, the, the extent of what you were just uh, talking about, uh, because we don't always um, have that much focus on, on remittances in this financing uh, discussion. Here you see just a, a quick global visualization of the flow of remittances uh, from countries of origin where the, the dots are, are white uh, to, to the uh, receiving countries uh, where they turn green from uh, just over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and every dot you see on that screen is, is one, one million uh, US dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so just coming back and illustrating some of that uh, um, 
some of the magnitude of this. Uh, thank you. Thank you for making that link, Marie. But I, I, I wanted to um, maybe just uh, dive a little bit deeper before we come to to, to other questions from uh, from from the audience. Um, what would you, you you alluded to some of the uh, potential solutions? But what do, what do you in this in the spirit of um, sort of cutting across sectors and having mm -hmm. um, uh, partnership-based solutions that cut across these various different uh, dimensions of the of the problems. Where where would you see the biggest potential uh, for making an impact with with, with regards to, to to migration and remittances in, in 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 that sort of recovery and development agenda? Well, certainly IOM has been focusing, as have a lot of other um, organisations, uh, and there is actually a call from the UN with all of the different um, agencies within the UN to ensure that we are able to um, enhance remittance flows, to make them more sustainable and so forth. But in different parts of the world, we're seeing different partnerships at the, more, at the local level. And what I mean by that is really within countries um, themselves. So in the Pacific, there has been a number of partnerships, for example, to try and encourage people to utilize the technology by providing, uh, for example, the first sort of month for free to be able to reduce the remittance costs and so forth, to be able to get things uh, moving. Of course, that means that we have to have um, money to remit. So migrants need to be able to uh, transfer that money, of course, back to their friends and family. So the, you know, the, the broader economic environment is going to be particularly important. But we are seeing an uptake uh, because of isolation, because even migrants won't be able to get to the uh, money transfer operators' offices. There has been uh, the need to utilise technology and utilise, for example, mobile money applications. Mm. And that has seen significant uptake in areas where that is able to be, um, where it's able to be utilised. We have to be mindful too, of course, around ICT accessibility issues globally. Um, in some parts of the world, there isn't the same access uh, to ICT as there is, say, for example, uh, in Switzerland, uh, in the United States and in other countries. There's also the gender implications that are particularly important. And we've seen for a long time, over many kind of decades in regards to remittance uh, research, that women migrant workers tend to remit more in terms of the proportion of their incomes. Um, same at the other end, they do tend to use more of the remittances being transferred on uh, their families and their communities. However, their um, access to ICT can be lower in certain parts of the world. That's not everywhere, that's not uniform. But also their salaries tend to be uh, lower than for other sectors. And I'm here, I'm talking about domestic workers um, we're talking about healthcare workers, those who work in agriculture, for example, harvesting and so forth. So if we can especially put through a gender lens uh, in regards to migration and remittances, understanding the existing research and analysis to be able to tailor tools with specialists in the field, with the industry, the technical kind of components, with money, um, uh, remittance mobile money app, providers, but ensure that they are able to counter some of the potential negatives or unintended consequences, then we will have a much more sustainable and also a much more effective way of tackling um, some of the challenges that we're, be that we're seeing at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and thank you for um, making, making that, uh, illustrating really that, that multidimensional uh, nature of the, of the problem. I want to, I want to bring in um, a couple of points here from, from, from our participants and maybe starting with the first um, question around which of the SDGs you see acting uh, as push factors for migration uh, and have these changed under COVID and, and therefore should be, should be prioritized uh, by policymakers. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, sort of inequality um, is a, a very significant issue. And of course, uh, the human development reports of late last year really highlighted that. And that was right across a whole range of different uh, aspects in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of human rights and so forth. 
um, one of the aspects that we've incorporated into the map is it's not just the inequality, it's also the ability for um, communities, for people to see how others live, increasingly so because of the pervasive nature of some of the telecommunications technologies and so forth. So trying to marry those sort of tensions and provide opportunities for a range of different um, communities, especially through safe, orderly and regular migration, means that we need to be countering you know, the illicit practices such as human trafficking. Mm. Uh, many people are very concerned about uh, COVID-19 and the immobility restrictions creating further pressure on communities as they engage in what some would call survival migration. So there's, there's that aspect. Um, but being able to forge um, partnerships, whether that's at the regional level, whether that's at the sub-regional level, to be able to provide opportunities, including through uh, international and internal migration, uh, then we will be able to actually try and uh, you know, really soften some of the differences and the difficulties uh, going forward. It's, it's not going to be easy. That is uh, most definitely the case. But to be able to recognise that through some of the key data um, is, is, I think, going to help in terms of showing that clarity out of the complexity to point to areas of you know, significant action. So the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, of course, is actually gaining um, a lot of ground in the context of COVID-19 because it is showing how important it is in, to have international cooperation for these types of outcomes. Right. Brilliant. And there's, uh, that leads quite nicely to another question that came up. Um, from, from the participants really making the link uh, to data. You talked about that and the importance of, of really having um, uh, systematic data uh, collected on, uh, on, on migrants. How do we ensure though um, that there's no infringement on privacy? So that link with that, that, that whole um, digital rights and, 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 and privacy discussion in the context where um, that is obviously a very, very, very important factor. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if we're talking about, uh, and this one is certainly coming up in regards to the monitoring of mobility. Uh, mobility in the context of COVID-19 really has brought to the surface um, the capabilities to uh, monitor how people move, where they move, exactly where they're going. I mean, there's a number of big, you know, providers and big tech numbers companies who have uh, released, you know, community level data to show that, uh, that there is a, a, you know, very significant amount of data. And of course, the privacy and confidentiality um, issues are very, very significant. And there's a lot of focus on that, which I think is, a, is an enormous um, strength in, in our system, that we are able to see that there are privacy concerns and push for um, enabling people to protect their, you know, digital privacy. Um, one of the things, again, that COVID has really brought to, to the surface um, is the need to protect um, our, our privacy and our data and so forth. In the context of apps that relate to safe remittances, for example, it has almost the opposite effect in terms of instead of going through informal systems which have been open to exploitation and abuse, uh, being able to use mobile money apps that are able to be traced, that have um, a different kind of like infrastructure backing them has actually shown over time, and this is long-term research, not specific to COVID-19, that it is safer for migrants to remit money through uh, mobile money applications. So technology can be sort of double-edged. It can provide real benefits, but it can also have some downsides that we, as a, you know, an international community, need to be monitoring, uh, especially as they relate to human rights. And, and certainly privacy has come up uh, quite significantly in regards to, to mobility, of course. Brilliant. And um, maybe this is a good um, moment to bring back the, uh, the, the map again, uh, because there's a question that really builds on this point here around around talent patterns and uh, the, the the question is uh, to what extent the um, the impact we see right now on, on on changing migration patterns 
um, partly, of course, uh, as a as a response to the um, uh, to the pandemic. Uh, but but how that trickles down to business and and, and mm -hmm. sort of making that link to um, you know the 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 impact uh, changing migration patterns have on on businesses and, and and the economic recovery agenda. You touched a little bit upon that in the beginning, but maybe you can elaborate a little oh. bit on that. And point. certainly um, in the SDGs, you know, international students are highlighted in terms of their migration because we know that in many um, systems and countries throughout the world that international students are a key, not the only, but they are a key feeder group uh, for talent mobility uh, sort of purposes and so forth. And we are seeing, uh, unfortunately, the, the COVID-19 mobility measures are not, um, they're not specific to groups of people, they're not specific to asylum seekers or refugees or migrant workers. They have also impacted um, uh, international students very significantly and we will see the ramifications for the longer term. So businesses will be affected by the immobility regimes and, and the reduction in um, international education services, if I can put it that way, mm. um, for ye many years to come. Uh, on the upside, again, it's, everything is double-edged. But on the upside, we are seeing a real push for improvement in virtual education. Now, virtual education, of course, cannot replace uh, in-person uh, education and tuition. I, I think there's, you know, groundswell of um, agreement on this. But what we can utilise is we can use uh, virtual platforms to reach people who we wouldn't necessarily have been able to reach before, to try and work harder, to be able to, you know, get uh, children in displaced persons camps, to be able to access uh, education services, for example. So while we're seeing talent um, mobility, you know, really reduce along, uh, along the same lines as other cohorts, it does highlight that there are some other opportunities that we do need to uh, explore and work together on. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And this ties into a final question that I want to bring in both from the audience and then make it a slightly broader um, question. The, the uh, point is here about whether, whether some of these economic implications of migration are really widely understood and what you maybe as, as IOM are doing to, to, to help convey and communicate that, that, that wider impact. And if you allow me <clears throat> in bringing this to sort of a wider question and conclusion for this, um, for this session, really reflecting on how we can more effectively um, bring this complex understanding, the multidimensional nature of these, these problems that we're uh, dealing with into organizations and how you, how, how you reflect on that uh, from, from the perspective of where you sit. Well, exactly. And we certainly have been approached in regards to assisting uh, with some of the thinking uh, around impact investing, for example, for migrants and for refugees, because it also makes a lot of business sense. Um, I would go back to uh, some of the work that we have utilised in our own research and analysis by McKinsey and Co. And, you know, some of the big picture um, macroeconomic analysis that they have done in recent years. So they have estimated, for example, that international migrants have contributed 9% to global GDP. I think that was in 2015 or 2016. But at the same time, we know that international migrants were 3.4% of the global population. So there's so much research and analysis. We actually used it in one of our thematic chapters for the World Migration Report 2020, our flagship publication, to really highlight that um, migrants make enormous contributions to our societies, including through economic um, means, but also uh, socioeconomic sort of issues, uh, civic political issues as well, their cultural kind of aspects enrich our lives daily. But the, the economics are pretty clear. They are, they are very, very much needed for um, economies in order to be able to uh, support labour markets and support growth. So one of the ways I think that we need to tackle that is to try and get more of a balanced message out 
often the challenges of migration and displacement are highlighted, but there are significant opportunities. And many people uh, online today are international migrants themselves. They work with international migrants. They understand that, but they might not necessarily think about themselves as migrants. And that I think is part of, part of the challenge for all of us to be able to identify clearly what we're talking about in terms of some of the definitions and the concepts to not just think about migrants in kind of negative terms that are challenging systems but to think about migrants also as some of the vectors for change that some of the big contributors to our societies brilliant thank you very much marie i think this sets up um, ourselves very nicely for the for the kind of action agenda we want to see in the following days i should say if you want to carry forward this conversation after the session. Uh, please don't hesitate to, to connect with and reach out to, to Marie after the session. Uh, all the material that we referenced is, is available to you. You've uh, just seen the link come through in the chat. And uh, of course, we're, we're very happy to uh, carry that conversation forward as well in terms of how you can tap into some of these resources um, more systematically in your respective organization. So with that, um, let me let me thank you, Marie. Let me thank uh, the the audience for being being part of this kickoff discussion in a way for uh, what is hopefully for everyone a very impactful and uh, productive sustainable impact summit 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.